Hello and welcome to the Business Octopus, where we talk about all things sales, marketing and technology. I am Aidan Collis, CRM and Marketing Automation Specialist at Relevate and All Around Good Guy. Today I'm joined with Paul Kennedy from PGV Consulting. He's here to talk about how to get in front of your ideal customer. Something very important to most people. I'm sure if you run a business, you definitely want to be talking to the right person. Um, so first of all, today's episode is sponsored by ripperhosting.com.au, fast Australian servers for when it counts. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Good, thanks, Abel, and uh, thank you for having me on today. No worries at all. So I guess uh, let, let's kick it right off and say how important is having a business plan? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, let's, we've got to at least know where we're going and how we're going to get there. I think otherwise it's kind of just heading in any direction and hoping you end up in the right, uh, the right outcome. And I often refer to it as being like a, a cork in the sea. And that is, if you don't have a plan, you get taken to other people's tides and that may or may not be where you want to be. So you've got to be in control of where you want your business to go and hence the plan. Um, having said that, once you do have a plan, and perhaps we can touch on this later, it's also to be open to other opportunities that you might not have thought of in the plan. So, yep, absolutely have a plan, but also be open to other, other things that may occur along the way. So you don't just uh, stumble into your ideal customer straight away. So uh, what, what sort of things would you look at when you're, when you're planning to, or how do you start to planning? Like what, where's the first point? Right. Um, look, I, uh, where's the first point? I, I love Simon Sinek and I love start with why. So in terms of where to start, I think if each of us can drill down and work out our why as to not what do I do, but why do I do it? And if you become clear on that, I've found that if you've got your why right, the other questions like what, where, how, when, the jigsaw comes together much easier. Whereas if you start off thinking about what I do, mm. it can actually lead you in some false directions. So I'm very keen to encourage my clients to uh, identify their why and I, I seek to work with them in that regard. Having said that, I've got a few uh, lines that I hope might be helpful today. One is, uh, in terms of a business plan, Nirvana. Nirvana is when you get your ideal clients to seek you out. And that being the case, coming back to your question about a business plan, I think whatever goes in a business plan is whatever it is that's going to take you to that end goal. That end goal being where you get to the point where your ideal clients are actually seeking you out as opposed to you always having to seek out your ideal clients. And that comes about by creating a brand that reflects who you are, what you're about and why you're about it, and also how you can help your clients. So I try to work backwards in that regard. And, uh, and as I say, whatever takes you towards a position where your ideal clients will come to you uh, is a good thing and should be built into your plan. I also believe that as good as that is, it's imperative you also know your non-ideal clients. And the reason I say that is because sadly, they too will seek you out. And whilst, and that can be a huge distraction of your time. So whilst you'd always be polite and, uh, and uh, accommodating and helpful as best you can, it is really wise to understand your non-ideal clients as well. What are their traits? What are their characteristics? And some obvious ones would be people who can never afford or aren't willing to pay for your services or people who, in spite of good intentions, never actually get around to following your advice. Um, so look, those are just some of the traits that I would suggest in terms of identifying ideal clients, another thing that I've found has been quite helpful has been focusing on your non-ideal clients and then reversing the criteria. And by that, I mean, it's easier to actually perhaps win a client and think to yourself as you're driving home, well, yes, I've got a new client, but I'm not quite sure that that's going to work out very well. And that being the case, it's helpful to analyze what were the criteria? Why did you come to that conclusion? And then turn it around and write it in a positive light. So an example would be, 
an ideal client would be somebody who is both willing and able to pay for your services or somebody who is both willing and able to act on your advice and that they do actually implement it. So sometimes by taking the negative and then reversing it can help you identify who your ideal clients are. I think you've taken a very uh, interesting approach and you use the word brand there. And I think it's important to highlight that, um, you know, that sort of language is generally taken by marketing people who suggest you need a brand and they tell you why. And I think it's very important to highlight that your background is not marketing at all. Uh, it's actually quite, uh, quite heavily in the finance world. So um, I think I'd, you know, we, we talk about on this podcast a lot of in terms of perspectives of different professionals and, and understanding uh, different things. So, you know, m me, myself, I like to take um, uh, multiple source reporting and evidence from a number of perspectives to really highlight why someone should think in a certain thing or do a certain thing rather than just, you know, people get a confirmation bias. You read a lot of uh, things um, that are positive towards X um, and so you start believing X and you only start looking for evidence that supports your theory instead of disproves it. And I think by highlighting the fact who's not your ideal client is very, very clever. And, and I think that the, from that analytical perspective, um, you know, that's an incredibly important insight over and above every marketing person, every little channel that says, you know, get your right client, do your branding, 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 branding. Everyone says that, but no one tries to cover off on any of the, those other parts. So, so thank you very much for doing that. I think also your, your comment about confirmation bias. Um, I found that when I'm guilty of that, and I guess we're all guilty of, of it from time to time, all you're really doing is you end up agreeing with yourself and what you already believed and knew. So um, mm. it's always good. I, I enjoy reading other people's comments on any particular topic. And I just find it gives me a much broader and wider and hopefully more enlightened perspective on whatever the topic is. Uh, and I think an ex sometimes an external opinion really helps, you know, like a uh, perfect example is uh, 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 between you and I, we had, uh, you asked me for an email template and I gave you something and it had like three or four call to actions. Now I actually run some uh, marketing training sessions where I say very explicitly in every week, I only have one call to action. And for me, uh, it didn't even trigger at the time. So it was good to have some, or, or I think, I think I sent it to you and then you called me back and said, we need to talk about this. And then I was like, you know what? There's a problem with this and I can see it. And then when we spoke about it, we were talking about the exact same thing. So we were, and, and that was, that was an interesting example. And it just proves that in spite of us knowing things, we still all commit the old sins, don't we? And, and I do too, Abe, on the, in that case, we were really, and I think that's not a bad example, where you were wanting, or I thought it would be good to introduce you to somebody. Mm. And by the time we had that original email, it was going to take around about at least 30 or 40 minutes of that person's time to read and click on each link and find out who you were. Yeah. And my comment when we had the phone, the follow-up phone conversation was, and if you'll excuse the politically incorrect comment, it was like dating. It was like, on your first date asking somebody to marry you and wondering why the answer was no and i think coming to relationships and connections and ideal clients that was what it was about it was about let's make the initial introduction get to learn a little bit about each other and then see the value in each of us learning a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until the relationship is more solidly based and coming back to your original question about why have a business plan? Because all of these concepts, I believe, are integrated or interrelated. And again, the analogy of the business plan, if you don't have one, you could end up going and building a house and you try to put the roof on first. And obviously that's never going to work. So it's about putting that foundation down first. And in business, the original foundation, I believe, is the, is the business plan. So, um, so many of these analogies, I, I think, hopefully they're helpful to people in seeing the wisdom of what we're suggesting. And I, I think, um, you know, that sort of long-term relationship thing is important no matter what business you're in. I know that um, the big thing is uh, at the moment is, is ads, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, uh, and it's extremely short-termist. And the only winner in that 
uh, is is Facebook or, or, or Google. And I think a lot of people forget that um, that's really just to get new people or new new hands to shake. But after that first handshake, there then needs to be follow-up conversations. There then needs to be, you know, additional value provided or exchanged until they get to the point of, well, why wouldn't we work with X company? Um, you know, the option is, is a no-brainer. So that relationship bias that we all have takes time to form. But once you have it, it's very, very hard to break. Just before we came on today, I was checking my um, my emails, and there was uh, one there that took my uh, took my notice. Uh, a year or two ago, we were always reading around social media that you had to have quality content and you needed it to be consistent. And I I, I do believe that. Um, and everybody talks about content. Well, the headline today, a year two years later, said why you don't need content. And I I smiled at the irony of it that. One, one moment we're running in one direction, we're going north, and then a year or two later, those same people are telling you, no, you should have gone south. And um, I do think there's a bit of a fine balance between the two. So each, each has their story, and uh, I think it really comes down to what are you trying to achieve? Who are you trying to get your story in front of? And what's the best way, or in fact, the best ways of doing that? It's not just one, there is no silver bullet, there are a number of approaches and strategies that I think we all need to be doing so that we are regularly touching our ideal clients and making them aware of what we do and particularly how we can help them. And I think each of us needs to perhaps operate in that vein. Well, you know, it's interesting when you talk about content. Some people are not producing content for content's sake, trying to get algorithms, clicks, likes, looks, whatever, without actually trying to address the human, the reader, the person who is actually uh, consuming the content. And so yeah. on a medium, you know, we, it's like we're jumping between icebergs. As soon as you jump on it, your body heat is melting it. And so it dissipates and disappears. And then you've got to try and find another one. So where, you know, pre-internet, everyone's pummeling your, your mailbox. And then now we've got, um, you know, digital, everyone's pummeling your inbox. And then um, now during COVID, everyone's gone, oh, can't, can't go door to door. It's going to be email or it's going to be LinkedIn. And so now people are shutting down from those. And so my, my mailbox is getting full again. So it's kind of just going around and around in circles. So. I, I absolutely agree. And look, I'm like yourself. I'm connected to lots of people. I receive lots of content mm. and from people who are just excellent at what they do. But it's almost... I think it's almost the two extremes. They almost over communicate. They have so much that I couldn't possibly read it all. And if I did, I simply wouldn't get any client work done either. So yeah. I, in my own case, my defense mechanism is to, because I want to keep it. Yeah. And one day I will get around to reading it or watching it. And, uh, but I have it automatically that goes into a default subfolder. And it is, it's really good, good stuff. But they might be sending out two or three messages a day. Now, on the other hand, you have other people, and I'm probably a bit guilty of this, is who under communicate. And I think coming back again to the ideal client, I think you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the reader, not in my shoes or somebody else's shoes. And you've got to be there enough so that when that person, your ideal client, has a need, that you're top of mind. And if you're sending those people two or three messages a day, they're probably not looking at any of it. On the other hand, if you're only communicating with them once every six months, they're definitely not aware of you. I think there's a very fine line mm. so that you don't want to be so in people's face that I don't ever want to hear from Paul Kennedy again. Yeah. But on the other hand, you don't want to be so infrequently in their face that they say, I'm not even sure I know Paul Kennedy. Or who? Yeah. And exactly. And, and I do, I think, a lot of mistakes are being made at the moment. I think there is that fine line. You need to be there enough so that when the time is right for that person, that ideal client, that you're one of one or two, hopefully only one, people that they think of and come back to. And that takes you back to where I began, which is Nirvana, is when your ideal clients seek you out so that I could be receiving uh, content from you and I look and I get to the point where I'm actually looking forward to receiving the mm. next email from Avon yeah. because I value the quality of what's in there. And when I get it, I look at it. 
And when the time is right, you're the person I will come back to, as opposed to many people who, as I say, are just excellent at what they do. So I'm not denigrating their quality at all, but yes. it's just that they drown you and it almost ignores the shoes of the person who they want to win as their client. They physically cannot watch all of it, so they watch none of it. So. Well, if, if uh, I've got a statistic that'll blow people's minds, there's uh, something like in the last two years, there's been more content created than in all history prior to that date. And someone put a gift together and it's got like 3,000 years worth of watch, watch time. And, uh, you know, within the first second, you can't then um, watch any more of it, or of it because more content has been created than what is in that gift. So um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I think, I think we're almost at the point now where we have answers to questions that haven't been asked. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it can be like time redundant as well. So, um, you know, the, the, but it, ironically, it's the older content that ranks higher in, in Google. So if, um, you know, when you're talking about those emails and someone's getting uh, email, 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 email saying, hey, buy from us, buy from us, buy from us. Uh, instead, what they should be doing is here is some value for you. Here is some value for you. So, you know, we're working with a client at the moment that run um, training for, uh, you know, Microsoft suite of packages for, for big businesses. And uh, we've just got an email series with two keyboard shortcuts, two things that can save them five minutes here or there on a Monday morning at 8am. Someone will open it up and go, hmm, I'll try that. And, uh, and then next time, you know, in two weeks time, when they get the next one, they're like, oh, I like these. So I'll keep, I'll keep them. <laughs> hey boss, uh, have you seen these? These have been quite useful. Maybe we should talk to these guys about a course. Absolutely. And, and Avon, it's not just the, the bit about sell, sell, sell at every opportunity. Um, yeah. The ones I was talking about, their content, as I say, is really good. Yeah. But it's just too much. And I physically don't have the time to do that and also service my clients. So yeah. I, I think it's also not only the content, but also the quality, uh, sorry, the quantity, the quantity. Yes. Yeah. And um, another, another one of my theories is that Obviously, if we really drill down, and I, I come back to that, you really need to drill down on who your ideal clients currently are, yep. who you would like them to be, and who they could be. And there are three different questions in there. Yep. And then once you've answered that, how am I going to get my story in front of those people on a regular and consistent but not overwhelming basis? Mm. And equally, I cannot be at every event or in every webinar where my ideal clients are. And I need to recognize that. So another theory I've got is you need to be good at succinctly explaining to people what it is you're about and how you help people and have one or two or three or four different examples of, of how you've achieved that and what the outcomes were for that client. And depending on your audience, use one or two of those stories, case studies real quick and so that the person who you're talking to can become your business development manager. So that as and when, or your ambassador, and that when they're out and about and they're mixing in groups or in a board meeting or in a cocktail function or a barbecue or the sideline of their daughter's netball game and they're chatting to some other business person and a conversation comes up, give them the ammunition so that when the person they're talking to raises an issue they're currently coping with in their business, that you can respond and say, oh, look, I know this guy, Avon Collis. He's actually uh, in that field, and I've been doing some work with Avon. It's really excellent what he's been achieving for my business. Do you want me to send you his details? And that's what I'm saying. Turn people or get people to a position where they can be your business development person mm -hmm. and ambassador on your behalf. And I'm a great believer in that. Tell people what you do short stories so they can reconvey those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that um, one of the things you, you sort of touched on there is like having different channels that it's across, you know, like sometimes it's email, sometimes uh, you might have, you know, have a phone call with someone. Other times you, um, you're you having, um, you know, sending a video or something or, or even some physical mail, you know, the Google have this thing called the 7-Eleven 4, which is seven hours of um, engagement or contact over 
11 touch points over four mediums. So they reckon that's the magic formula. So 70 hours could be you're on the phone for 30 minutes. Uh, they watched a video about you or several or, or watched a few, read a few posts. So a touch point could be that they, you know, they met you here, they did something else there. And, and over time, they build up that relationship bias. Uh, and by being on four channels, you know, one thing I always talk about is building three-dimensional space in the two-dimensional world. The only way you can do that is have other channels that you're, you've been seen on and cross promote across them so that people can understand that there is depth to you. You are a person that someone has walked around, has shaken hands with you, even if they haven't have done it themselves. So that allows someone to have that trust by proxy so that when they come up to you and they say, hey, let's go and do something. Like you're saying with those stories about, um, you know, successful examples where someone has, you know, succeeded with um, your product or service. So Absolutely. And, and look, um, we talked about some of the, um, uh, some of the ways of doing that, those forums um, that perhaps have been in use more recently. They could be Zoom meetings, but some of the old traditional methods still work one-on-one -on -one coffees, presentations to okay. groups of people who have an interest in an issue that you're a subject matter expert on, um, a phone call. So some of the old methods and really a mix of all of those things, because I come back to where we were at the beginning, I don't believe there is any one silver bullet, but mm -hmm. if you do a mix of those various forums, um, then people will gradually learn a bit more about you, what value you're bringing to the table for them Mm. And that's when the time is right for them. You're the person that they will think of and come back to. And this comes back to uh, uh, confirmation bias and um, attribution bias as well. So uh, if you're doing the same things and you go, this isn't working, how do you know? Because you haven't tried those other channels. Absolutely. So yeah. then you don't know which one is strong. The other one too is like, there's such a strong focus on digital marketing. And as you know, somewhat of a digital marketer myself, um, I think it, there's some false logic in that um, if you think that all of your sales come from, from uh, digital channels, then you are sadly mistaken because not only uh, maybe that was where they converted, but they might have seen you at a networking event, watched a, a video um, and, and some disconnect, maybe received something in the mail, you know, had some disconnected um, journeys, maybe seen a billboard even. And when they finally get to the point of conversion, that's where you attribute the sale without having seen all of that lead up. That led, led up to it, absolutely. And, and I think that's an excellent uh, summary because you get to the point where all of those things have come together. And particularly if you haven't swamped the person, I'm a great believer in not swamping them with too much, mm. which you and I were nearly guilty of the other day um, until we stopped ourselves. Um, but the good thing is, one is that confirmation bias kicks in in a positive way. So that's the yeah. first thing. But the other thing is, you really want to get them to the point, your, your ideal client, to the point where, as I say, they are actually looking forward to the next communication from Avon Collis. Mm. And the reason that will happen is because they actually, actually value mm. what you have shared with them on previous uh, interactions. And... Um, and it comes from all of those all of those forums that we talked about. And when you get to that point, you're not just driving a sale, you're getting someone who is, oh my God, yes, where do I sign? And they kick the tires less, they don't argue, they they they're happy to pay for your services. They actually Absol want to work. Absolutely. That 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 last point is so good. If you achieve that, get to the point where your ideal clients are actually seeking you out, mm. then an issue that other people uh, suffer from is around price and a race to the bottom, who's cheapest. You yeah. suddenly remove that from the conversation because price for the person who's now approaching you is no longer the main driver. They actually want Avon Collis. And I really don't care too much about the price. Mm. I still want you to be competitive, yeah. but I actually want your expertise to help me achieve my goals. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think with that, we've probably covered exactly how to find your ideal client and get them speaking uh, volumes about you. So thank you very much for your time today, Paul. And um, if you're listening and you want to uh, take advantage of uh, your com uh, a conversation with, uh, with Paul, you can go to pgvconsulting.com.au 
or check him out on LinkedIn. Both those links will be in the comments section of this episode. And um, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. If you have any questions of us or if you would like to be a guest on the show, you can always check us out and uh, fill out a contact form at relevate.com.au. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time today, Paul. It was great having you. Thanks again. Thanks, Avon. No worries. And take care. You can learn more about implementing scalable systems in your business with our book, The Business Octopus, where you can learn how to give your business a brain and teach it to grow itself. You can get your copy from relevate.com.au slash octopus. You can also find answers and ask questions in our online community at support.relevate.com.au.